Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, uh, Can Direct Electron Detection Be Used to Improve EBSD Analysis? Before we begin, I'd like to cover a few housekeeping items. At the bottom of your audience console are several application widgets you can use. If you have a question during the webcast, you can click on the Q&A widget to submit it. We'll try to answer the questions during the webcast, but if a fuller answer is needed or we run out of time, you'll receive an answer later via email. We do capture all the questions. A copy of today's slide deck is available in the resource list widget that looks like a green folder. You can expand your slide area by clicking on the maximize icon on the top right or by dragging the bottom right corner of the slide area. If you have any technical difficulty, please click on the help widget. It has a question mark icon and covers common technical issues. Finally, an on-demand version of the webcast will be available a few hours after we finish today, and it can be accessed using the same audience link that was sent to you earlier. Now I would like to introduce Dr. Patrick Camus, who's our presenter for today's webinar. Pat received a BS and PhD in material science from the University of Pittsburgh. He spent 18 years in atom probe analysis at Oak Ridge National Lab. Uh, National Institute of Standards and Technology, and the University of Wisconsin-Madison. Pat then worked for 15 years in electron beam microanalysis at Thermo Fisher Scientific. He moved to EDAX early in 2013 as Principal Product Development Engineer and became Director of Research and Innovation in 2014 and Director of Engineering in 2017. So now over to you, Pat. Thank you very much, Sue, and I thank everyone for joining us today for this webinar. Hopefully, I'll convey some new and interesting information for you so that you can uh, look forward to making some uh, decisions in the future on EBSD products. What I want to do is to refresh for uh, experienced people and to introduce for some newer people in the field uh, what some traditional EBSD hardware designs tend to look like. These are the parts inside the uh, slide that you usually don't see, but it uh, is very important for understanding uh, the advantages and disadvantages of different uh, camera systems for it. So the traditional method is that the electrons come in uh, from the sample, hit a phosphor screen, converting it to light. So that has an energy uh, dependent efficiency, and there could be slight spatial blooming or spatial uh, expansion, blurring, if you will. Uh, from the actual location coming in. That's the way phosphors work. Then the light travels through the glass that's supporting the phosphor screen. There could be some losses associated with that. Uh, could have in this system a second piece of glass, which would be the vacuum interface. So now you'll have additional potential losses of the light going through that piece of glass. Then, of course, the light has to go through some kind of a lensing element or series of lensing elements. There will be some losses associated with that. Could also have a little bit of distortion because of the uh, curvatures of the lenses might distort the beam slightly going through. Of course, the optimum design is to minimize that distortion, but there still could be some available. Then the light comes out of the back of the lens and hits the video camera uh, sensor, whatever that technology is for the sensor. And that has some known efficiency, usually since we're only dealing with uh, monochromatic and not uh, color uh, directly here. You usually tune the phosphor screen to match the emission from the phosphor screen wavelength to match the efficiency of the lens of the, seat, of the chip, sensing chip to get maximum uh, efficiency. But it's not always 100%. There is some known uh, deficiencies there. There is an advantage of certain technologies that you can be able to bin the pixels that are on that sensor that can uh, increase, mathematically increase the number of the light intensity for those pseudo pixels or bin pixels and gets away from some of the noise capabilities. So that is possible on some technologies, but not available on all technologies. So the general advantages for traditional hardware would be Straightforward mechanical design, as I was showing, optical and uh, physical design. These are well understood technologies, and it can scale with video advances. I'll mention that 
a little bit more detail later, you'll see that there have been a variety of sensor technology changes, but the front half of that uh, diagram is still uh, I, nearly identical. You just have changing the sensors in the back. The disadvantages are the image distortions that I was talking about, mostly with the phosphor screen and the lenses. And there can be signal losses at each stage in the uh, image transfer until it gets down to the sensor. Uh, there could be a potential uh, difficulty, mostly for the manufacturers, uh, but also for the users if you want to upgrade the cameras. Depends how customized the camera is that you have on the back. Uh, it can get very cost prohibitive to change those cameras depending upon the design that's actually used by the manufacturer. So what do you really prefer in the EBSD design features? Well, you'd like to really reduce the number of the signal losses. You'd like to reduce the amplitude of the signal losses, get that efficiency up as high as you can. Reduce the inherent noise in the whole system. There are physics origins that there's noise, stray light, uh, reflections on the inside, and also camera origins that there's noise inherent in the different uh, sensor technologies, they have different uh, noise levels for reading the signal and also dark current noises. Uh, <clears throat> because EBSD is a very dim uh, signal that you are always dealing with the low light levels in the sensor, so you have to deal with those noises. So there's a lot of noise that, you, that the designers have to uh, understand and try to minimize. You would like to reduce the image distortions. As I mentioned, there are some things like the phosphor screen or the lenses have subtle distortions in them. They're always minimized as best as you can be, but they're never uh, reduced down to zero. And you'd like to reduce the number of parts just for mechanical because the more parts in the system, there's always a bigger chance of something going wrong. So the EBSD technology is very much parallels uh, the technologies that are used for TEM, or transmission electron microscopy. Uh, you can see them listed. We won't go through each and every one of these, but they progress from phosphor screens and films on both of them all the way through, and TEM has actually progressed much faster. There's many more uh, users for those. It's progressed a lot faster. And the last one at the bottom there listed is direct electron detection using silicon. If we go to the EBSD, it started out uh, with uh, phosphor screens and films, and went through a variety of technologies for the sensors, mostly uh, through types of different video cameras of different technologies. And only very recently have we gone into the similar technologies that TEM has been in for many years, with the first commercial release of the CMOS camera uh, last year. And we've seen uh, a few publications uh, coming from research facilities on a direct electron detection using silicon. So we're going to be talking about those two in particular and what the capabilities are, what advantages those two uh, technologies bring to the EBSD uh, analyses to the use, that the user can exploit. So uh, the first one is the CMOS cameras, uh, how they compare to what people now uh, are using with the uh, CCD cameras. Well, they usually have a much higher pixel density, not always, but most times. But they usually come with a higher uh, speed frame rate. They can read the frames much more quickly than the CCDs did. And that's the, the biggest advantage seems to be going in that direction for the CMOS cameras. The disadvantages, however, is generally, and it's on a camera-by-camera -camera selection of all of these parameters, but generally they have higher noise in the system themselves. Um, just the electronic circuits have a little bit higher noise in general. Uh, generally, lower pixel sensitivity, so when the light hits the, the uh, sensor on it, usually there's a little bit of extra losses compared to CCD. CCDs had a lot more history, much more mature technology, so its uh, performance is a little bit better. CCDs, uh, CMOS cameras are a little bit newer technology. Sensitivity isn't quite there. We expect it to get much better over the next uh, following years, uh, we look forward to advances in that. Um, CMOS, in general, has no or very limited amount of hardware binning, as I said. Uh, CCDs can be binned up to 16 by 16 bins, which means you would take uh, 256 pixels and sum all those intensities together once and read it one time. Uh, CMOS cameras usually aren't designed like that. There are some that will bin a little bit, but nowhere near 16 by 16. So you have to deal with 
the realities of whatever that binning uh, advantage gains you, you don't have that uh, advantage with the CMOS. CMOS cameras also have a very slight uh, disadvantage, and the manufacturers are getting better in getting around this, is that each pixel actually has its own amplifier. So actually, if the amplifiers are not all corrected or tuned to one another, you can get very subtle intensity uh, variations across the field of view. As I said, manufacturers are working towards correcting that and or having calibration routines to get around it, but it is something to be aware of at the present time that is not necessary on a CCD camera. So just to show you uh, some results, CMOS cameras work very, very well, and in these cases are working at extremely high speeds. These are some simple samples. I say that because they're uh, pretty straightforward for in the uh, samples that most customers will be using. So an Inconel single-phase nickel sample on the left, uh, 3D printed nickel sample in the center with very small grain sizes, and the dual-phase steel uh, austenite ferrite uh, on the upper right-hand corner. Pretty straightforward samples, everyone's seen these, and CMOS works extremely well for those. Uh, a little bit more challenging samples, uh, examples using a CMOS camera. Uh, deformed ferrite on the upper left, you can see that there's variations in the colors, which are the uh, deformation that is within the grains structure. Uh, the alpha beta titanium in the center, uh, much more challenging you to be able to differentiate uh, the crystal structures in this, so you need a little bit higher quality uh, diffraction patterns. It has to run a little bit slower. And the upper right-hand corner is the uh, very fine-grained aluminum samples, aluminum having a lower atomic number, has a lower density, has lower backscatter coefficient. A little bit more difficult so to uh, collect, so you have to expose for a little bit longer to get a little bit more signal, so the frame rates are a little bit slower on those particular ones. Just like a CMOS camera, you can also collect the EBSD with the EDS uh, data. So this is a uh, chi-scan example with the EBSD simultaneous with the EDS. Uh, there's significant beam current here, so it was operated at 1.2 million input X-ray counts per second for it. The right-hand uh, display is the phase determination due to the EDS, which was used for uh, pre-selecting the crystallographic uh, uh, crystal for the EBSD so that it can get the uh, orientation map on the left. So once again, pretty typical uh, uh, data sets that we get with the EBSD with the CMOS compared to the CCD. The uh, frame rates are significantly higher. Uh, about about five times higher in these cases in the absolute maximum. But the disadvantage, as I noted with some of the disadvantages earlier, if you're running at five times higher frame rate, that means you're running at 150 exposure time. To get the same amount of light onto the sensor, you need approximately five times more beam current. And in most of these experiments here, we were running in excess of 50 nanoamps of beam current which is approximately five times higher than these typically operated for these same samples when you use a CCD. So physics still holds. If you're running five times faster, normally you're going to need five times the exposure uh, at the same sense, effectively the same sensitivity level. We can talk to say if it's 5.1 or six times higher, but ballpark, they're all about the same. You are running more beam current with these CMOS to run at these higher speeds but it is possible, and it works very, very nicely, gets very fast scans, very high quality data. In contrast, direct electron detection scheme is a little bit different than what we have seen. Uh, the electrons come in, there is no phosphor screen, they go directly into a piece of silicon, and they get converted into electrons. Then you have the read electronics, uh, solder bumped right onto the piece of silicon, so the electrons go right into the solder bumps, right into the circuitry for each individual pixel, and so they are measured directly right into the chips. The only conversion factor is the electron to silicon conversion. There's no distortion because it goes right in, it goes right onto the solder bumps. So as you can see straight off from the beginning, a lot of the mechanical and opticals are removed out of the system and it goes straight in and out. Um, there is an energy dependence of the uh, conversion of the electrons in the silicon, as you would expect there should be. 
What's even more important, though, than the energy dependence of the silicon is actually surface barrier losses. This is a very similar process that is occurring in EBSD here with the direct electron as what you would see in an X-ray detector when you're trying to input the lowest energy X-rays possible into an SDD, for instance, the surface barrier becomes very critical in how well that those X-rays penetrate the surface barrier and how well that charge cloud inside is extracted out for the measurement. So it's a very similar technologies uh, between X-ray detectors and direct electrons, especially for low energy inputs of either the electrons or the X-rays. So the intensity is measured out. All the pixels are measured independently on independent circuits, all coming out the back, and then it uh, creates the pipe going out and you measure the intensity coming out. There are two different methodologies of putting the silicon onto the wafer. I'm not going to go into details. One of the references I show will have all the details that you need to do that from the people that uh, manufacture these types of uh, detectors. So what are the general features for the direct, alone, uh, direct electron detection? So high total detection uh, sensitivity, uh, that's with a very high electron detection efficiency in and of itself. The high quality electronic circuits on the back, each uh, pixel has its own electronic circuit. Uh, very low energy SEM operation in general, uh, limited only by that surface barrier I said on that. Uh, for instance, you it's very rare indeed to be able to take a TEM direct electron detector that's built for 100 to 300 keV electrons and put that in and use that for EBSD because the surface barrier on the, on the front of the silicon sensor uh, is not amenable for the lower energies that are usually used for EBSD, uh, 20 keV and below usually. There's zero image distortion. Uh, that's very beneficial for uh, pattern distortion measurements, i.e. for the strain, the very advanced techniques by doing strain, looking at very subtle distortions in the uh, diffraction patterns from pixel to pixel or from a pixel to a reference. Uh, we can eliminate all of those uh, difficulties from the, uh, electron op from the optics of the system and because it's a direct electron, you don't have those distortions. And it's the uh, as much uh, noise is reduced as possible in the electronic circuit. All these circuits are hand-tuned specifically for these energy levels. And so they uh, can have very, very low noise capabilities on here. Now there are disadvantages. As I said, there's a uh, charge measurement circuit on each pixel. So the more pixels you get, the more electronics you have. So relatively speaking, it's a high cost of electronics. Uh, you're not going to be seeing these things uh, for a few thousand dollars anytime soon. There are separate amplifiers and very similar to the CMOS that these individual amplifiers for each pixel do need to be calibrated. The manufacturers do have calibration procedures to put in essentially white light and then you calibrate everything up to get those to be uniform intensity. In general, not rigorously, but in general there's slightly lower pixel counts. Typically these are 512 square uh, sensors, there's actually uh, two by two, 256 square sensors to give you 512 square sensors. Uh, the more sensors you have, the more electronics you have, and the cost goes up, but there are designs to go to uh, upwards of 1K by 1K uh, pixels for this. They also do run at a slower frame rate. Uh, it has to do with the generations of the electronics out the back. Um, uh, there's very rarely any binning associated with these, so actually if you take talk about the second generation of these direct electron detectors at 1500 frames per second at 512 square pixels going through, you're actually talking about well in excess of gigabytes of data per second maintained at these frame rates. So it's mostly the electronic speed and the pipe going into the computer that is the rate limiting step here because it does dump the whole frame all the time. You can't bin these down usually to get down to, for instance, 50 by 50 pixels to increase the speed or the frame rate to increase the speed through the pipe. These always come in at full frames. The current designs come in at full frames and it's the frame rate at these full frames. And I'll be talking about 512 square. So here are some references for uh, direct electron detection in general for electron microscopy and some uh, EBSD specific 
uh, papers that have been done by research uh, locations to show uh, both quality of diffraction patterns and also uh, quality of uh, maps, CBSD maps. I will not go into the, those details, but you will have those uh, as a reference if you download the PowerPoint. Um, just in general Venn diagram of where the second generation 1,000 frame per second DED would be, so it's a higher sensitivity is what we're expecting. Speeds not quite as high as the high speed CCDs, uh, but uh, better, higher speed than the large frame CCDs, better distortion than all of those. So there's some, it's a multi-dimensional space, but in these two dimensions for sensitivity and speed, there's a wide range that the DED will uh, cover and is superior in some of these operating regimes. What I'm going to show you is some comparisons of uh, our current uh, high-speed uh, CCD uh, camera for EBSD and a uh, prototype feasibility camera that we've been uh, working with uh, to look at uh, the performance capabilities. So we'll show you some comparisons that we've had of these. So what we're going to be doing is showing on the same sample with as close to the same solid angle as possible. Uh, between the two cameras, the geometry is a little bit different, so it's hard to get exactly the same geometry and uh, solid angle, but we get as close as possible. Uh, at the same uh, beam energy and beam current and exposure, since we can control those very accurately, we're doing that exactly. So we're trying to compare as much as we can apples to apples to see what the performance is of CCD cameras and a direct electron on a wide variety of samples and operating conditions. So let's see what some of these results look like. Oh, and all of these are uh, patterns that are as collected off of the sensors and the um, and the direct electron. It's not and uh, the cameras. Uh, there's no background corrections. There's no other corrections applied. So this is raw data off of the uh, sensors. So now we have the this one is uh, high KV on nickel, trying to get a brochure quality diffraction pattern. The sensors of the patterns look. Uh, pretty similar, but if you look very closely on the uh, direct electron, you can see that there's significantly more features on the third, fourth, fifth, or higher order diffraction lines that are going through there. So it's really a high quality. You can see where any of those subtle distortions I was talking about uh, are totally eliminated with the direct electron, really pristine when you're trying to go for the highest quality exposure. Now if we go and set an exposure that's a approximately 100 frames per second exposure. So we look to see what it is. Left-hand images looks pretty good. Uh, the right-hand image looks pretty good also, and it's even slightly better in quality. Uh, I don't want to say it's factors of twos or fours better in quality, but it is uh, slightly better in quality uh, here at the shorter exposure time. If we go to even faster exposure times, uh, the DED really, you can start to see where the lower noise on the DED is actually showing you uh, much better uh, quality of the diffraction pattern, whereas you can see the four, the four main poles in the CCD image, but here you can see even uh, very higher order uh, bands in the direct electron image. So there's significantly more information in the direct electron at the same exposure time for the two competing technologies. Dropping the KV slightly, as we know, the backscatter coefficients will change for this. This is still nickel. This is for a long exposure, so trying to optimize and get the best brochure quality patterns we can. The left-hand side is reasonable, not superb for the CCD, but the direct electron is really quite good. Um, there's higher order uh, zones easily visible throughout, and then you can see the second order uh, zones going through. So it's significantly better with the direct electron here at 10 kV. Uh, if we drop down to 5 kV now with long exposure times, again, to optimize the quality, you can see the 5 kV on the CCD tends to be blurring out a little bit. You can see the major bands, but you can see all the subtle variations and all the subtle banding that's in the direct electron. So the direct electron really is quite significantly more sensitive at the low KVs when you uh, treat the silicon correctly and having the low damage front contact surface on the, uh, on the silicon. 
If we then take the 5 kV and now go to 100 frame per second exposure, uh, you'd be hard pressed to find very much at anything. You may be able to find one or two bands in the traditional CCD, but the direct electron actually, you, your eye can pick it up, the uh, software can actually pick it up quite easily. The Huff transform totally amazes you when you're dealing with patterns of this quality, uh, but that pattern can be easily indexed from the direct electron uh, at these kinds of exposures. So once again, identical geometry, identical exposures, and the direct electron is really quite nice. And just to show a uh, map for a very difficult sample with the perovskite, uh, it's a complex crystal structure, uh, relatively low density because it's an uh, oxide, uh, so it has a low backscatter coefficient. It's an easily damaged sample, so you really don't want to put a whole lot of beam current into it. So it's really a quite difficult sample. This sample was done at high uh, beam energy at 30 kV, but it's done at only 100 picoamps, and it's run very slowly to be able to get enough signal to be able to do it, so it was only running at about 10 frames per second. But you can see there are some pixels. This is unprocessed data. This is the raw map data coming through. There are some noise pixels in there, but by and large, that's a very high quality pattern on an extremely difficult sample that is uh, not something you would like to attempt every single day. Unfortunately, some of our uh, collaborators have to work on samples like this every day, but the direct electron really makes it possible uh, with its higher sensitivity and lower noise to be able to work on these extremely difficult samples. So in summary, the direct electron in detector generally collects better patterns at shorter exposures and or lower beam currents than both the CCD and the CMOS. The DED collects higher quality patterns at all voltages, even down to as low as 5 kV uh, than any of the phosphor, be it the CCD or the CMOS cameras. Uh, we just haven't uh, done any experiments lower than 5 kV uh, ourselves. Obviously, that's a test to be done in the future, but it's not a super high priority right at the present time for that. So I thank you very much for attending. I hope that gave you some uh, good information on what the technologies are, uh, why the different companies would be investigating some of these technologies, what the benefits are for the users. Uh, there will be a number of us at the MAS conference, the EBSD conference in Ann Arbor uh, next week. Uh, so if you have any uh, questions that we don't answer today, feel free to talk to those people uh, next week about these. Um, in addition, you can uh, refer to additional resources that EDAX has on uh, EBSD at a variety of these locations. So now I will go through and uh, see what kind of questions have come up. Uh, one question, the first question came up, how do you quantify 12 times more signal? Uh, I was actually looking at what the intensity histogram was, the raw intensity histogram coming off of each of the sensors. And so the more signal that you would have, so the um, usually when you're at very low exposures on many of the uh, video camera signals, you're only using, we'll say, 128 uh, intensity levels. Even if the camera is a 16-bit camera and can theoretically collect 65,000 intensities, if you're going to very low intensities, you may only have 128 intensities that you then brightness contrast stretch. Well, what I was looking at is that on the CCD camera, that number may have been, we'll say, 128 intensities that we were getting, but on under the same exposure conditions, I would be at something like 12 times more values were coming through on the um, measurement on the histograms for the direct electron detector. So it has its own A to Ds on a pixel by pixel basis at that level, and that was the amplitude that was coming off. So that's before brightness contrast, it's just the raw signal uh, coming off the raw measurements of that. Uh, let me see, is the energy dependence improved with DED lower KV compared to the current cameras? Uh, it sure seems to be. Uh, you can go down to at least 5 kV quite easily uh, if you have the right front contacts. And by the way, you have to have the right front contacts on CCD cameras also uh, for the light that's coming in. So you have to have that tuned. And you have to be careful on the uh, illuminization of the phosphor screen. So all of that it comes into play. So yes, there is an energy dependence. But the DED, uh, for the example that we were running, is significantly more sensitive, at least down to 5 kV, we expect below that. Because phosphor screen, the efficiency of phosphor screens 
below uh, 5 kV starts to decrease very markedly uh, because of the uh, amplification, the light generation uh, goes as the uh, energy. So the more energy you put in, the brighter it is. The less energy you put in, the dimmer it gets, and therefore you're working against the dark current in the sensors. So we expect the DED to have an even greater advantage at KVs lower than 5 kV. Why not a 256 square detector? Um, you could do that. The, a little bit of the problem has to do with the solid angle generation. If, you're only, if you want the same solid angle with a 256 sensor, then you have to shorten the working distance or the camera length uh, between the uh, sample and the detector, and that just puts the uh, piece of silicon that much closer to the sample. Uh, there's always discussions on that. You w would have one quarter of the um, pixels, uh, but then it would be the uh, solid angle. It mostly gets down to a solid angle. Uh, there, you can see um, uh, the seam sometimes. That's getting better with the, each generation of the fabrication of them. Um, but in general, especially if you do background corrections, uh, the uh, seam will go away and it'll disappear. Uh, it's the same style of technique. There are many different sensors out there for a wide variety of uh, technologies and industries that use pixelated sensors, uh, large sensors that are pixelated and have edges in here. Uh, it's a routine uh, technology for these uh, sensor companies, so that's not a problem that we have to be really too concerned with. Um, why is the traditional signal circular and the DED is rectangular? <clears throat> That's very easy to answer. Uh, the DED is uh, square because we have four pieces of silicon that give us a square sensor. That's an easy one. Um, the, our CCD um, that we have for our EBSD is circular uh, because we use a circular phosphor. Uh, all the uh, Huff analyses are truncated to a circular analysis for normalization of the Huff transform. So everybody truncates their software to be a circle anyhow. So we have just historically always used a circle. You could use a rectangle if you wanted. You could use a square. You could use a truncated rectangle if you wanted. It doesn't matter. You're always going to be taking the center portion of the sensor, which has the highest um, quality, the highest intensity will be hitting it, the highest quality will be doing in the center there, and then you're going, the software will truncate it to a circle around that for the Huff transform. So we just have historically used a circle that's inconsequential, really, what the differences are for them. Uh, are there any latency, latency issues with the phosphor screen at high collection speeds? Uh, it's extremely important that you do have fast phosphors. Obviously, if your phosphor has a decay rate that occurs in hundreds of a second and your frame rate is thousands of a second, then you're going to have uh, pattern persistence in the camera. That They actually designed that into old-fashioned CRT so that, you're, so that it could blur between frame one and frame two and your eye would be able to pick that up and integrate over it. However, with scientific phosphors, you have to be extremely careful that the phosphor decays fast enough for the frame rate that you're dealing with. And we have shown in our system that uh, we have frame rates in excess of 1,500 frames per second, and there is no persistence in it. Our phosphor screen decays quick enough that we can get very sharp transitions on grain boundaries on the phosphors, and that's not a problem for our systems. Is energy filtering thresholding a possibility with your DED? The DED we were using does have a thresholding capability. We only touched on some of it. Um, it's, um, yes, it is possible. The uh, question I still have to go back to the manufacturer for that is to actually, there's, and, and usually they have four different levels of the threshold. The problem is I don't know how those levels of the threshold feed back into the, K, the incident KV of the electrons hitting. So for instance, if they're coming in at 20 KV, if we have four thresholds, are they four equally spaced thresholds from 0 to 20 kV, or are they set at 1, 2, 3, and 4 kV for the thresholds? Those are some fundamental questions that we will be investigating going forward. It's a very good question. Of course, we would like to be able to use those 
to filter them out because that way you can filter out the secondary electron signals uh, and some of the lower uh, energy electron signals and just dominate and stay focused on the highest uh, energy electron signals in it. So yes, a very good question. It is possible. We haven't done uh, a much detailed work on that. Does the visible quadrant illumination variation affect band detection? Um, it hasn't so far. Uh, it's mostly because we've been trying to tune the four quadrants as best they can, and it's even more difficult than just four quadrants. It's actually on a pixel basis. So yes, there is a calibration. We have done a basic calibration. It's possible that maybe we should do a detailed calculation, but at the quality level that we were showing there, uh, the quadrature lines that are in there, the slight variations, uh, have not caused a problem uh, with indexing any of the diffraction patterns that we show on that. So yes, we want to minimize that for a commercial product, but at the level that we're showing today, it's not causing any problems at all. Uh, what is the difference between the first generation and the second generation DED? Why the speed is such a big difference? Well, the, first, the difference between the two generations is the electronics. And uh, besides that, I don't know. Uh, it's the electronics is totally different. It's how they approached it, how they do it. They've also put in additional options into the electronics. Uh, they're actually working on the third generation of electronics now. There's prototypes going out for CERN where most of this technology is originating, and they have it going to the next series of uh, advantages in the electronics. So the main difference between Gen 1 and Gen 2 is purely the speed. There's some other second order benefits we might be able to reap, but it's primarily the speed, just to bump it up by at least a factor of 10 in the speed, more than a factor of 10. Uh, okay, seeing that's uh, the uh, majority of the questions, um, I will close, wrap this up by saying thank you very much for joining today. Uh, please download the uh, presentation, uh, look at the references, they will have a lot more details on a lot of the physics and the science of the direct electrons themselves and some of the historical papers that have done. So I thank you very much and have a good day.